I am Erin Hamilton, and this is video blog number two about digital identity for class IDS 403, term 16, EW5. How is my digital identity different from my real world self, and how is it the same? For what I post on my social media networks, LinkedIn, my website, Instagram, Snapchat, texting, email, Fitbit, and most often, Facebook, I do post as this, as if I am in a digital panopticon because my social media has been monitored by people who have talked about it with me in real life. I may be telling a friend or my father about my weekend and a common response is, oh yeah, I saw that on Facebook. My father is the most common person for this. Um, we talk every Saturday on the phone and although he has a Facebook, he doesn't fully understand how to use it. He only has a few friends and mainly uses it to keep up with me because he has realized it's a great way to know what is going on with me and a 10 minute phone conversation once a week just won't cut it. He didn't start following me until my first deployment so I could be in the middle of the ocean and with operational security in mind, he could know what I was doing daily. I was one of the very lucky and very few who had social media access at sea. Because I was technologically up to date in my office, I became the social media manager for the ship. This is where my real understanding of the power of social media came into play. Our target audience is the American public, but more personal, the families at home who long for tidbits from their sailors. We were able to showcase to the public what we were using their tax dollars for, but we were also allowed to show families what their sons, daughters, mothers, and fathers were all doing. We became the eyes of the ship, and the people who regularly followed us would wait for our photo upload each day, just hoping to see a photo of their sailor. Due to this openness on the ship, I had to rethink my own personal social media practices. It took a few weeks of getting into the habit of really thinking about what I was posting and did I want the world to see it. Sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't. My real world self cannot hide these things, but my digital self can. How does technology enable me to more fully express the specific dimension of my identity? Being in the Navy, I have friends and family scattered across the globe. Friends in Germany, Italy, Japan, or Bahrain can see what I'm doing, and I can also see what they're doing. I can be somewhat of a people person, and part of my identity is actually caring about individuals, and not so much what they're doing, but how they are themselves are doing. Social technology has allowed me to keep in touch with these people as I wish, so that I can further my compassion with them from my living room. How does technology govern, influence, or shape my identity? Again, because of my job, I am governed personally and professionally by public affairs guidances and social media handbooks mandated by the Navy. Time and time again, and specifically in the past year, members of the military are getting punished and reprimanded for their social media practices. How does technology govern, influence, or shape my identity? Again, because of my job, I am governed personally and professionally by public affairs guidances and social media handbooks mandated by the Navy. Time and time again, and specifically in the past year, members of the military are getting punished and reprimanded for their social media practices that do not agree with the service branch's ethics. Particularly, there was an issue with Marines in San Diego after the Orlando nightclub shooting, spewing hate language against the LGBT community, as well as across all the branches for the Black Lives Matter movement. If service members post questionable language, they are subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Many people don't realize that we are ordered to follow acceptable social media practices and policies. This has shaped my technology in that I don't want to post something that will get me in trouble, so why post it at all? How is my digital identity a product of the social and technological context in which I live? My digital presence, though restricted, has developed me into a more careful and mindful person. Once I started thinking, I don't know if I should post this, I wouldn't post it. When Turkle tells us we should put down our phones more, I agree. As a new practice, that was very hard for me to overcome, and I do not look at social media on my phone now until I'm at work. I used to look at it as soon as my alarm went off, but once I stopped looking at it immediately, I noticed a change in my attitude within weeks. As a result, I'm much happier and I generally post less. When I'm out with friends, I'm the one to say, please put your phones away, we're eating dinner. Some have blown me off and I've gotten upset, but others can see where I'm coming from. I usually get the look of... You can't be serious. What am I going to do without my phone for 20 minutes? And this is where we end up having great conversations. Turkle tells us that when we have a conversation, we can't exactly control what we're going to say like we do in an email, text, or post. There is no delete key for the human voice. Once it's out there, it's out there forever. How is my online identity like a performance? How is my online identity like a performance? 
Ornstein tells us that we are like actors on a stage when it comes to social media and that all eyes are on us. She kept doing it because at first it was fun and addictive, but then she realized she spent so much time on the craft that the benefit didn't outweigh the work anymore. For my work social media page, it is exactly like a performance. I have to post certain things at certain times for more viewing traffic, and I have to be overly happy and enthusiastic with it. When it comes down to the point, I am not that happy in real life, and I am not that enthusiastic. My work social media identity, I feel, would be like someone who thinks there's no pain in the world and no hurt or suffering and that everything is rainbows and unicorns. I am not that person. I am a real person with real feelings, both happy and sad. How is my behavior different when I know it is public? How is my behavior different when I know it's public? I wouldn't say that my behavior itself is different in public, but I would say that what I allow the world to see as my public behavior is limited. A good rule of thumb is if you wouldn't want your grandmother to see it, don't post it. While this generally sticks true, everyone's grandmother is different. What's acceptable for one may not be for another. Some would say my choosing of posts may make me feel guilty, but it doesn't. Because I'm a private person, there are things in my life I don't need people to always know about. Tim Rainer speaks of the game that we all play and it, that it follows simple rules. Post what we love or stays with us, converse over the social media, and be creative but not a phony. I believe that only part... I believe that only part of my digital identity is posted online, but I do not believe it makes me a phony. I just simply do not need certain people in my business trying to stir up any kind of drama or bad memories. For the bad memories, and because of an unbelievably difficult way to delete a deceased person's Facebook, once a year, I am reminded of my mother's birthday. With, the, with their new on-this-day function that Facebook has, I get to be reminded of my younger self, questionable decisions, and awful memories that... I wouldn't have otherwise remembered. I look at old posts now and I think if that happened today, I wouldn't have posted that. How does my digital identity affect my sense of who I am as a person? My digital identity does not define me. It may for some and may have at one point, but at this very moment in my own life, it does not. I've said that there are some things that I wish not to share with the world. For a long time, it was that my mother had died. I didn't want all the pity from everyone else who didn't know her. Those who were close to me knew this. I did choose to make some postings when I was younger, but now that I've dealt with it and understood it will never get easier, I choose not to think about it and hate being reminded of it. One of the more positive things I choose not to post, for example, is when I go hiking. If a hike is just okay, I'll post pictures that I've taken, but if it's amazing, I don't. It becomes a secret for me, for my eyes only, and to me, that is precious. That, this brings it back to being a private person. Not everyone has to always know what I'm doing, what I've seen, or what I'm going through. One film scene that I really pondered on was in The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. The main character goes globe trotting, trying to find a world-renowned photographer and instead begins his own adventure. While hiking in snowy mountains in Asia, he happens upon the photographer. They talk for a moment and a photo opportunity the photographer has been wanting for days finally happens. We watch through the lens, expecting the satisfaction of a shutter click, but we don't get one, because he decides not to take the photo at the last second, and then the moment is gone. When the photographer is asked why, he said he wanted that moment for himself. I believe my stepping away a bit from social media is me taking a breath and having moments to treasure for myself. These are important to me, because I want to remember my life with my mind, not just with social media pores. Dawasar mentions the measuring of moments. Far away over there is now here, she says. Before the world at our fingertips, we used to get bad news in small doses. Now, we get bad news every time we look at a social media post or a news website. Rarely will we see a good news story, but I believe it is making us more negative as a society. Not checking my social media first thing in the morning did make me a more positive person, and I wonder what the rest of the world could do if they did the same.